get settled, I might make a start for the final session of today. Um, so our next speaker is Mark Richardson. Uh, so Mark teaches industrial design at Monash University and he is a former senior designer at Ford. And he'll be speaking today on um, ideological democratisation in design from Henry Ford to make a culture. Please welcome Mark. everybody. Um, yeah, it might seem a bit strange that I'm comparing main culture to uh, Fordism, but um, <laughs> by reading the Ford's um, biography or autobiography, there's a lot of correlations which I found between his ideological um, ideas and those which we're currently seeing in, in maker culture, um, although they're expressed in, in different ways. So up on the screen here, there's Neil Gershenfeld is to your left. He's the guy that wrote... Um, uh, the book Fab, um, uh, The Revolution on Your Desktop, um, from desktop um, computing to uh, fabrication. So he, in 2005, he released this book talking about the democratisation of tools in order to be able to, for, for people um, to have equitable access to means of making things. And that was almost exactly 100 years after Henry Ford produced the, or, or, or manufactured the first Model T, um, which was to democratise um, personal transport or make accessible personal transport. I'm using the, the, the word, uh, the term democratisation quite loosely here. Um, but the transport, uh, car transport and personal automobility would, would be made more accessible to um, uh, as many people as um, could afford it. Or he, he lowered the, the boundary, uh, the the price boundaries so that um, regular people, the people on his, on his um, production line could afford the cars that they were making. So I've, I've come from Ford and I actually found this study a, a really kind of eye-opening experience. Um, having designed a Ford, I was never exposed to any of these um, kind of ideas. Um, so I, I, I designed glossy cars um, that were made with high-end machines and through highly technical processes. But now my research is in how I can take some of these ideas of moving people around and make them in ways that um, anybody can have access to. So um, this little Bailmobile up, up on, the, on your right um, is a result of my PhD study and it's a tensegrity structure for those of you who are um, uh, au fait with tensegrity. Um, uh, and um, Kenneth Nelson and Buckminster Fuller's work. Um, it is a fully tensegrity structure, so um, it, it works quite well. I can show anybody who's interested afterwards. Um, so, talking about how we can make lightweight structures, this is made out of components from the tip. Um, and then I've designed a little 3D printer for my first year students to make, um, which is using off the shelf components, um, standard extrusions and um, electronics that you can get um, very cheaply on, on the land. So I'm trying to blend some of these ideas um, in a design practice, in design practice. So the car is facing a, a range of issues. We've, we've expressed these, um, or they've been expressed throughout this conference um, uh, by quite a few speakers. Um, but we're also faced with a, a socio-technical change that, that's, that's really quite interesting, like there's, there's these shifts in technology and, and cultural development um, that are going hand in hand to really reshape the way that we engage with the world around us and with products that we use on a daily basis, <coughs> we're looking at um, um, virtuality and autonomous systems, um, uh, mobile distributed factories, 3D printing cars, um, the additive manufacturing side of things is, is growing at a great pace um, and in terms of being able to uh, appeal to um, economies of scope it, it's making a huge difference. This is Nervous Systems, um, they're a company that uh, in Europe that, that um, uh, have a generative system that anyone can get online and parametrically alter uh, the geometry of, of um, parts that they're, that they're working with. Mostly it's jewellery, but they've developed this dress, for instance, up here, that 
you can alter the geometry of the parts. It compresses the dress down into a form that fits into a small um, 3D printed um, bed volume or build volume. You print it and then it expands out to be a, a, a dress. So these sorts of things are really changing the way that we consider production and, and the way that we think about mass production. That, that um, the old production line, while, while there is um, a huge value in production lines in terms of efficiency, that there's this subculture of um, uh, distributed and, and localised and, and um, the long tail, I guess, of production, which means that anybody can have a go and put it up online and, and sell something. Um, so we're seeing this shift in terms of um, standardised products or the standardisation of products to the personalisation of, of products, and these are being um, mediated by, by digital tools like 3D printed CNC machines, um, laser cutters, for instance. Now, it's interesting because this, this is coming back to some of the, the maker culture, which is what I've kind of come to, it looks at being able to not just um, democratise products, but they're enabling people to make their own things. And I think this kind of goes, goes back to the arts and crafts movement, particularly the writings of John um, Ruskin, who's, um, who talks about the... Um, joining intellect and labour and, and being able to do these things and getting a, a, the joy of labour um, because you're able to combine mind and making um, in, in the same instance. Um, now the resurgence of this has largely come from, or, or the enabling resurgence of this kind of thing has come from um, the open source hardware um, guys who, who uh, this is Adrian Boyer, the guy that's got a parent in his hand up there. I'm not sure who this other chap is, one of the other very clever rep rap guys. They um, developed a, a machine that could replicate itself. So on, on, on your left is a Stratasys machine, that's a 3D printer. It costs $250,000, which is way out of the, the scope of most people. Adrian Boyer, uh, some of the patents have run out on that machine. And Adrian Boyer thought, well, why don't we take the essence of what that machine is and make it available for people to buy for just over a thousand dollars US? Um, and they did. And so the whole RepRap movement was born. It's an open source machine. It's um, uh, mediated by a, a, an entire digital network. People are sharing ideas. There's forums. There's um, troubleshooting. You can go and talk to people on the other side of the world and. Um, and, and get advice as to how you might fix an issue that you, you have with your machine. It has version control and it's, it's, um, it's set up um, as, as a, in the same way that an, an open source software system might be set up, it, it's an open source hardware system so that um, uh, anybody can, can access this and add back into the network. And as a result of that, we're seeing a whole range of 3D printers coming out, commercial 3D printers now, for the domestic market. Now, I know a lot of people are, are, are saying, well, we haven't got anything to do with them yet, so what's the point? And yes, I agree, at this point in time, we're kind of still making landfill with, in, in many of the cases with these. But I, I feel like there's this growing connection to the, to the manufacturing tools that will enable um, uh, a more granular distributed network for future um, the, for, um, future iterations of, of manufacturing. So that maybe we can um, establish a, a digital or a, a web-based system that groups together these disparate um, machines in people's homes. Um, so when we when I talk about maker culture, I think this is kind of the immediate uh, image that comes into people's minds. It's hipsters, yeah, they're a bit exclusive and they love their coffee and um, they make interest, interesting products but they're very aesthetically driven. When, when in actual fact, this is the embodiment of, of maker culture. This is Dale Doherty 
um, the founder of the, the Maker Fair movement, and, and his whole ethos is to be able to enable people to make from an early age so that they're grounding their ideas and their, their innovation in, in physical artefacts that come from their own hand. And some of the examples of this, um, there's uh, an electronics um, system called Little Bits, where you can buy these little modules for electronics and you can build up systems from these modules to do anything that you want them to do. Um, open Structures have set up a, a, a template for designing components so that you can swap components between different products. And there's a whole network now of um, components that you can, you can access and assemble in, in various ways. And there's a range of different um, embodiments of these, these products that are, that are available. Some are for free and some you buy. It, it's an open network. And then Ronan Kadushan, who's um, kind of like the poster child of, of um, the open design movement, or one of the first to kind of start talking about open design as a uh, from a product term, and he designed this hack chair, which is basically a single sheet of aluminium that um, you download the Illustrator file for, and you, the end user can manipulate where the lines go. You send it out to, to get laser cut or water jet cut from an, um, an industry supplier, or if you're lucky enough to have a laser cutter of that capacity at home, you can do it yourself. I suspect not many people have. And you make your own design. Um, so we're talking about provenance. Uh, and this is just as an aside, provenance um, yesterday, and, and I guess this is another thing which sort of feeds into that um, uh, debate about provenance, like is this a Roman Caduceus chair or is it the person who's, who's made the embodiment of that? And I, I would argue that it's both, and I think that's a wonderful thing. So Henry Ford, um, three tenets of his, um, his practice were service, waste, minimisation and generosity. Um, and Ford's, Ford makes four points in his book which um, uh, correlate quite well with um, some of the, the uh, points that are expressed by um, many of the, um, the open design uh, academics and crit critics. Um, the first one is that um, he says, failure limits a person from trying new things. Uh, and Maggie Culture says, um, or it encourages people to give anything a go and you learn through tinkering and, and failing. Um, Ford says the best person to, suited to do a task should do it and it's criminal to take that away from another. And maker culture says the best person to meet one's own needs is, in, is the individuals themselves and a good design should facilitate that. Ford's, Ford puts service before profit um, and maker culture promotes openness and generosity. And sometimes this is without profit um, but with the intention of sharing possibilities for making profit. Um, Ford says that materials should be bought fairly and manufactured into products to be given to the consumer at minimal additional cost. So he was quite generous in the way that he priced his, his goods and that was a, a very um, clear imperative for him. And maker culture says, um, or gives access to the tools with which raw materials can be shaped and the artifacts by the end user at, at, at material cost. So for instance, you've got a fresh printer, you buy a spool of material, you can make anything from that spool of material within the limitations of the machine that you have. So in the ideological expression, expression this is where the two divide. Um, Fordism uh, is an object-oriented system that is all about the product and making the product available and um, Maker culture is systems orientated, um, that makes systems orientated products so that there's a system that's got the primacy rather than the product itself. Fordism um, pre makes artifacts to go to market, whereas ide the, the ide ideological expression of maker culture is to make your own bespoke artifacts based on things that you can download off the internet. Um, Fordism looks at systems um, efficiency. Optimised for material flows, and maker culture uses energy efficiency or, or advocates energy efficiency. There are a few researchers that, that have talked about this. Joshua Pierce, for one of them, and um, Jeremy Rifkin has talked about this a bit too. 
Um, so optimising energy for, for on-demand access, given that you are making these things in your own home, the energy consumption required is very, very minimal. Um, the centralisation versus decentralisation, um, hierarchical versus flat-ish, um, uh, labour hierarchies, I suppose, where uh, flat-ish because there's still people who, uh, the webmasters, I suppose you'd call them, <laughs> Govern what goes on. Um, Standardisation versus personalisation and micro control. Like a, in, from my experience in, in industry, you're controlling each surface to a, a tenth of a millimetre, if not if not smaller. Um, versus macro controlled systems um, that uh, are able to integrate this raft of input from. Um, external sources or people, the citizens out there in the world. But Ford does sort of have some of the, or does correlate with some of these modularised ideas, like thinking of open structures before. The Model T Ford does express some of these ideas. You can see that the, this, this vehicle had a number of embodiments and there were common components that were um, designed to fix the, the vehicle together. Um, so you could personalise the vehicle in this in this embodiment. Um, however, he did sort of sacrifice the, the I guess what the arts and crafts movement would say. Um, he sacrificed the, the joy of labour in that process. Um, I mean, some people may enjoy doing this, but I suspect that a lot of people would prefer to be doing other things. Living. But at some at, at a critical point in time, and, and um, there have been a few people that have talked about this already, and, and, and Penny in particular, um, with the 1927 Buick LaSalle, um, when um, Alfred P. Sloan commissioned Harley Earl to come in and integrate the aesthetic of the vehicle into a, um, into a, a form that was sleek and beautiful and had dynamic lines. In doing this, he separated the form from the function of the vehicle. And in doing that, it allowed um, Sloan to introduce what he terms in his book, um, dynamic obsolescence, where you can have a functional form underneath, and anyone who's designed a car will, will, will know this, but you can re-skin over the top to um, facilitate fashion cycles. Which, in turn, as some would argue, um, uh, built a, um, a culture of conspicuous consumption and commodity fetishism. So I'm going to skip through. I've done quite a lot, <laughs> I've gone through a lot of my time. Um, but I would argue that we've, we're on a continuum. We're moving towards the idea of the, or the objectified object or the, the goddess, which you can see these people objectifying the, the, the goddess, um, to the integration of, of ego in the form. And so we become godlike ourselves, although that's a half form of thought. So um, I'm sure there'll be people who take umbrage to that. So um, we're coming back to, to maker culture and factory scenarios. There's a, a range of different ways that things can be made. But this is a fab lab up in the top left up here. And this is a micro um, factory, a portable micro factory on the, the bottom, right, uh, bottom left there. Top right is the Top right is a fab lab, and then this is Tesla's robotic uh, gigafactory there. So um, there's a range of ways that we can approach making things. But essentially what I'm saying is that the home be can become hard, um, a, a factory and with the distributed um, networks can embed themselves in our day-to-day -day lives. There are a couple of examples of this. Uh, the local motor Strati, which is the first 3D printed, uh, um, I guess it's a unibody, uh, design that um, printed all as one, print it, and, and following some of the, the, the key tenets of the Model T Ford, it's simple. They, they, there's four, uh, 40 um, assemblies that, that are involved in making this vehicle, so it's super simple. And if you've got a machine, you could actually print one of these at home. Although at the moment, and this is part of my next research project, is, is making a machine that's big enough to do this, that's accessible to the general public. 
and um, the OSP Eagle Tabby, which is an open source um, platform which they've designed uh, in Hong Kong and a range of people around the world are taking that platform, it's an electric, electric vehicle, taking that platform, platform and um, uh, making it theirs, um, adding, adding content. So that's Neil Gershenfeld again up there on your top, top left, posing with one of the, the iterations. And then there's another vehicle which is quite significant as well, um, Divergent Microfactories Blade, and that's a modular construction where they've 3D printed titanium uh, couplings to, uh, and joined by um, uh, carbon fibre rods that can be manipulated by length to change the geometry of the vehicle. It just means that you can dynamically update the vehicle itself. So I guess as a, as a final thought and, and um, as, a, as a question, I suppose, more than anything, and something which I, I'm, I haven't really thought through the implications of this and, and need to start to, but, you know, we've got a socio-technical frame of automobility that's been with us now for over 100 years, well over 100 years, that has contributed largely to our urban environment and the way that we interact with each other. The question is, you know, and this is Adrian Boyer, again, with his... Um, uh, RepRap Prusa design, um, what this democratisation of tools and the system in which people are able to engage and make their own things in an unmitigated way, what that means for the next hundred years. And um, if we're able to incorporate these things into, the man into manufacturing cycles, what are the wicked problems that we face as we move forward? <laughs> scared actually by the uh, so named uh, ma makers uh, culture as it seems that the standardization process uh, is uh, going um, so such in detail to decompose an entire knowledge and in some way uh, carve from the inside expertise of people that have constructed their own professional uh, professional boundaries of expertise, but on the other hand, just making these, uh, um, uh, these artifacts uh, uh, close to people that don't have any expertise, it seems like we are decomposing, decomposing, decomposing the knowledge, and at the end, uh, we are taking a step backwards instead of uh, taking a, a step forward. Do you have any comment on that? I do, or, I do. I've got quite a few comments on that. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that this is bringing together the, the top level knowledge and the everyday person. Adrian Boyer is a, a well renowned academic in his field and he's, um, he's deliberately gone and made this machine to be accessible to everybody and be able to make it in ways that maintains that, that quality. And then what that does within, that, within the system, you'll have other people who have expertise in a variety of different backgrounds, um, not just manufacturing, but um, uh, systems analysis, um, uh, hardware, uh, uh, electronic hardware, software development. They all come together and they're working in this space and they're making the machines better. You, the, these open source machines now are getting to the point where you can get a quality product equivalent to a Stratasys machine. And, and Stratasys are, have been a little bit afraid of, of, of this and, and they actually bought MakerBot, which was one of the, the poster children of, of um, uh, the Maker movement for a long time. And they've slowly been closing them down. But the, the cat's out of the bag now. And I just think empowering people and engaging with people with the ideas that they have, it, it, like, I feel like as designers we often patronise people, and, but I think they often know what's 
best for their own lives. Is that me? Must be. Um, and and um, in, in enabling these meta systems, which have quality control built into the meta system, that you can actually have people engage on a more intrinsic level with the things that they're, they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm hoping that that level of attachment and intrinsic, or that intrinsic attachment comes some way against that commodity fetishism that we, we kind of experience through these mass production processes. That, does that answer your question? I don't think it does. But uh, <laughs> it probably doesn't answer your worries, but um, yeah, it, it's, it is, it's scary. Um, but I've seen it working in ways which is fantastic. And my first year students are doing this and they know very little about this and they're already having amazing ideas about how they'd like to upgrade their machine before they've even built their machines. So it's like, wow, okay. And if you have an open source network where other people can access these ideas and build on those. Because sometimes some people don't have the ideas to begin with, but can build on other people's ideas with the expertise that they have and vice versa. So. I just think, yeah, it's a, it's an exciting and at the same time worrying um, as a, a movement forward. But I think, yeah, we'll have to figure out ways of being able to mitigate the, the bad stuff. Uh, Mark, I, I couldn't help but see a parallel there with flip back to the 18, 1890s and the maker culture of the likes of Vivian Lewis building yeah. of Eagle in South Australia, Herbert Thompson, uh, you know, Pizzacoli and so on in Sydney. I, I, I just see that parallel. They got the germ of an idea from what they read in the communication of the time, the newspapers and the trade journals, yeah. um, trade journals for coach builders mostly. And, and then they just set two in a lot of the things you had on that right hand side of some of those diagrams. Yeah. They were makers um, yeah. using the technology at the time. I, I don't know if it was just me, but I could see a lot of parallels there. So, yeah. That's a, I, I actually, after, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. And I think that's that might be the next step for where to take this, is to start to bring it back to Australia and talk about how we've kind of engaged with the development of the automobile and, the, and automobile culture over time. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I love those stories of these inventors that do amazing things and then it just, you know, start a whole um, uh, a new movement. I, I, I just made a comment to extend that, actually, because I think it's, it seems to be something thematic that is coming into every wicked problem that we are facing as a society. I heard the same comment made about food in Canberra at the start of this week and food security and connection to food. I've heard the same thing said about the, sustain the wicked sustainability problems that we face as well. It's interesting, it just keeps on coming up, looking back 100, 150, 200 years and reflecting. Yeah, we're at the beginning of another cycle. <coughs> Thank you, Mark, for your uh, presentation. A, a very uh, concise and interesting set of ideas. It strikes me, one of the things that's fascinating about this, a couple of themes that are weaving through, I'm interested to get your thoughts. One of them is clearly mobility as it evolved as a, uh, a we'll call it a democratised platform, has had not just a mobility effect, but uh, an entirely a lifestyle effect and architectural and global impact. So that the way we live, suburbia, while it was created by the train, literally was sustained and, and, and made mature, if you could use that term, by the car. So uh, these new, and it could be argued that in a way the access to production on a very broad scale that the car uh, generated, I mean it has created things um, like hot rodding, which of course there's lots of in Castlemaine, and the idea of people, of people, it's created a language to allow access. Now this this the um, generational maker culture, which is kind of a materialization of the digital revolution that occurred in the 20th century, was in many respects um, mainly an educational revolution in the sense that the internet, it doesn't replace education, but it sure as hell provides a very powerful democratic tool. Yes, it needs curation, and there's a lot of discussion about how from within things like these universities, we can do things to help 
uh, guide people uh, at least to evidence-based knowledge. Mm. So it seems to me that um, the irony is that in some respects when the car was first invented, I don't think there was a need for it in a way. The need for the car got created by its presence in a sense. And it's clear that if you were, had the money to buy a, a, an early Daimler-Benz or the European cars, it was just an extension of a, of a luxury lifestyle. And it could have been anything, a boat, could have been more horses. But when it get, comes to Henry Ford and, and the creation of contemporary suburbia, that's a totally different, that's a platform that then needed it to maintain the lifestyle. So I suspect that this revolution will have the same sort of outcome. But I guess it leaves us with a very interesting question. While we're contemplating the arrival of the imprimatur, the, the imperative of this maker culture, this distributed manufacturing, what kind of society do we want to live in? And what ought we be asking ourselves, should we be doing with this great ability to get everyone making again? I mean, you're now seeing this intersection of neuroscience and, and um, paleontology and archaeology suggesting, people like Lambros Malathoros suggesting that to make is to shape your mind. And so that it is unbelievably significant as an educational tool, quite apart from democratising the making of things. So th that's a question for you in terms of what, it's going to take us somewhere. We want that to be a good place if we can possibly help it. Yeah. What might that be? Yeah, I, that's, that's a huge question, isn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, just to, um, to extend the, the Melophorus um, uh, expression there that, that he quotes Hutchins who says um, that making is actually thinking, that, that you can't you can't separate the two. Um, that the made artifact is is it's a thought that's embodied, I guess, in in, in materiality. Um, and that adds to culture and it feeds from previous culture. So it's a it's it's a it's a thought not just an embodiment of the thought. Um, or it's thinking, thinking, not just the embodiment of thinking. But um, I, I, the ro robots are probably going to start taking over the stuff that, that we would do in manufacturing anyway. If Tesla's gigafactory is anything to go by, yeah, so that's what happened. So where does that leave the menial task? You know, well, not even the menial, white collar tasks are now under threat. Yeah, I mean, as soon as artificial intelligence um, is is perfected, I suppose, then then what do we do with our information management management systems, data? Like, we just yeah. So so I, I kind of see it moving more towards um, empathy roles or, or care care roles, and maybe for the next forty years at least, when the robots don't quite have the empathy to deal with us in a hospital in the same way that a human might. That, um, that until they do, that we've got a little bit of scope to play in there. But I, I would hope that as, as people, we, we, and through these making exercises, this is what the maker movement is demonstrating, that we are connecting with each other and developing an empathy for each other through, this, through practice. And that there's that shared engagement and shared building of, of something that, um, uh, is greater than the sum of its parts, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I can't answer the big, the big question that's way out there. But I guess that's probably as close as the, the temple, though. The temple description there, Michael, is a really interesting thing for your for your research. That temple <laughs> progression and development and yeah. context that you just described. Again, thinking to the, the looking to the past and what things have actually occurred. Like that could be a really interesting angle for it, where you take that. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It's a very fertile topic for discussion, but it's my job to move us on. A lot of the themes from this talk will continue in the discussion after the following one, I think.